Uh, Mir Dagiovanovic from University of Belgrade in Serbia joining us. Thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation and the organization of this seminar. It's really nice uh, to be here. Um, the title of the presentation is Prototype Theory of Concepts and Analytical Account of Law Methodological Crossroads. Um, Basically, I explored this uh, methodological uh, uh, route of prototype theory of concepts in a recent book on the nature of international law. But as usual, uh, uh, you know, like after after publishing the book, after reconsidering certain positions, there is always space for further clarifications and for further advancement of the position. So I tried basically to do this uh, in the paper that I'm now presenting. So the paper starts with uh, two episodes. Uh, one was from the Paris uh, Zoo in 2019, where they had uh, uh, showcased uh, a new yellowish unicellular small living being, which was difficult to classify and which was named Blob after uh, 1958 science, science fiction horror movie. Uh, and the other episode was uh, from the World Athletics uh, Testosterone Rules, which applied to this distinguishing uh, between uh, those who can compete uh, uh, in female races or 400 meter races. Uh, and distinguishing according to this uh, testosterone level uh, whether uh, athletes, female athletes, uh, basically uh, do qualify to compete in female races or not. Uh, so both cases are just the illustration of the importance of uh, categorization and classification in our daily lives. So I use them as a uh, starting point to discuss basically three questions. The first question is, uh, is there any difference in the concept formation and categorization of items belonging to the natural, like blob and human made world, like world athletics, testosterone rules. Uh, and then I move to the uh, findings of uh, experiments in cognitive psychology which have over the years uh, demonstrated the importance of so-called typicality judgments of informants in various studies, uh, but with unclear, unclear uh, effects of those uh, of those results, uh, unclear effects with respect to uh, the possible uh, meaning and effect of these judgments for an underlying theory of concepts. And finally, I ask uh, whether those findings of cognitive psychology uh, have any bearing for our attempt to uh, conceptualize law uh, and for obviously for jurisprudential methodology as such. Uh, so when it comes to the first question, uh, uh, we obviously can start from uh, uh, statements like uh, Razi's one that concepts are placed between the world, aspects of which they are, and uh, words or phrases which express them and are used to talk about those aspects of the world. So there is an intricate relation between the concept, the word, and the, the aspect of the world uh, that we are, uh, we are trying to conceptualize and to denote with a specific word. Uh, this obviously immediately uh, points in the direction of the uh, connection between the processes of concept formation and uh, linguistic formulation. And very often, as we know, linguistic practice is uh, kind of the first step in, the, in various uh, uh, attempts to con conceptualize uh, certain aspects of the world. Well, uh, but I tried, I use a number of examples from different uh, uh, 
uh, spheres, uh, trying to show uh, that linguistic uh, formulation and concept formation are not necessarily the same things. That very much depends as also linguistic uh, and conceptual analysis are not the same thing. Uh, it very much depends on the aspect of the uh, world we are talking about. So I'm using the stories not only of blog but also chair, tolerable uh, practice which was recently uh, labeled in Anglo-American world in English language as smirking practice smoking with flirting outside premises and finally law uh, so the obvious the obvious difference that we uh, uh, basically all acknowledge is when we come to to the social world uh, then we face the, the problem of uh, a function of uh, different social artifacts uh, including the uh, complex artifacts like like law and uh, the basically the first question that uh, I'm asking myself in this paper is who question who is design designated with the task of concept formation and there we see the clear difference uh, when we take uh, different examples uh, nobody particular is obviously in charge of uh, conceptualizing a, a social practice which was labeled as smirking, which was somehow in the, uh, pre circulating it was uh, uh, labeled, named, and uh, uh, even certain content uh, as the things uh, unfold. But obviously, when we uh, turn to the case of blog, uh, we expect natural scientists to provide us with some sort of answers to this question. When it comes to law, uh, intuitive answer would be lawyers, but then uh, history teaches us that uh, practicing lawyers are not that much interested in, in the problem of the conceptualization of law as such. Uh, and then legal philosophers uh, come as, as a, almost a natural uh, second response to, to that question. The, the next question is whether natural scientists and legal philosophers are in the same position when uh, conceptualizing uh, in the first case law and the second case law. Uh, the short answer is no and a more elaborate one again we may rely on what uh, Ras has uh, once said on, on, uh, on this issue. And he says that we often give scientists a privileged position in forging our concepts. That is, we take the concept to be whatever it is in the hands of the scientific community working in the area concerned. Uh, and things are quite different with uh, social concepts such as kids, ownership, uh, law. Uh, they are used by all to understand themselves and others and their position in the world. These concepts are not merely tools of understanding, they are part of what shapes the social world we are trying to understand. If we could change them at will, we would be changing the social reality we were trying to understand. Uh, to my mind, this uh, implies that law uh, could not be, as it was phrased by Andre Marmot, revisionist concept. So, uh, legal philosophers uh, cannot simply uh, invent the concept of law, invent in the sense that it's not responding to, uh, to social reality, but on the other hand, it's also clear that uh, what we may find is uh, uh, the linguistic usage of the word law, or even definitions in the uh, dictionaries is far less uh, complex than uh, what is provided as uh, articulate uh, uh, conceptualization by legal philosophers because often those uh, words that are used to 
define the very uh, concept of law like normativity, like obligations, like bindingness, and so on and so forth, are also subject to further uh, theoretical uh, investigation. Uh, so, if in the process of concept formation, legal philosophers need to take into account how it is used in our everyday world, uh, it seems prudent to turn to cognitive psychology as a discipline which is focused on processes of categorization and conceptualization. Uh, and then, coming to this second point, I uh, try to briefly, obviously, sketch the, 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 the uh, debates which have led to, to, the, to the emergence of what is now called prototype uh, theory of concepts. Uh, the, uh, the result is uh, going against uh, what was labeled by uh, Georges Lakoff uh, 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 as the objectivist paradigm, uh, basically the, the standard picture of concepts, which he says was not the result of empirical study. It was not even a subject of major debate. It was a philosophical position arrived at on the basis of a priori speculation. Over the centuries, it simply became part of the background assumptions taken for granted in most scholarly disciplines. Uh, these uh, experiments in categorization uh, have shown that uh, there is a uh, uh, there is a steady and, and uh, uh, recurring uh, uh, effect of the uh, of, of these experiments in which uh, uh, informants perceive all instances uh, in terms of this typicality judgments, rating them uh, uh, on the existence of prototypes, that is the judged best examples of uh, conceptual categories where the term best here stands for some measure of central tendency. But uh, it is still unclear and uh, some of the most prominent cognitive uh, psychologists like Elizabeth uh, Rush uh, she was not clear whether this leads to, to some further and more, uh, uh, so to say, uh, more uh, um, firm uh, standpoints in terms of the structure of the concept or the mind representation of it, whether categories are represented in the mind in terms of uh, prototypes, in terms of uh, certain typical uh, typical uh, features. Uh, Lakoff strongly opposes uh, the idea and he claims that prototype effects result from the fact that knowledge is organized in terms of different idealized cognitive models, which are complex structures uh, uh, relative to which certain notion is categorized. And he uses fairly uh, uh, well-known case of Bachelor, which was first invoked by uh, linguists Katz and Hodor in their componential analysis and was subsequently criticized by Charles Fillmore to argue that this concept presupposes the conception of society uh, in which a male is expected to marry soon after reaching a certain age. Uh, so only relative to this conception of society, we may speak uh, uh, of certain features of uh, the, the uh, concept bachelor. But the prototype effects arise because in his word, words, the idealized model says nothing about the existence of priests, long-term unmarried couplings, homosexuality, Muslims who are permitted four wives and only have three, etc. Since the idealized model, as a rule, does not fit the world perfectly, unmarried adult males such as Pope or Tarzan are certainly not representative members of the category of bachelors. However, in case the, this ideal model fits uh, 
and situation perfectly, then categorization runs smoothly, which led him to conclude that bachelor is not a graded category, it is an all or none concept relative to the appropriate idealized uh, cognitive model. Uh, now to this, defenders of the classical view uh, was, were obviously not satisfied. So uh, they point out that the problem arises due to the fact that the search for necessary and sufficient features normally focuses on physical features and ignore mental, mental ones. Hence, uh, uh, in one of the also fairly uh, quoted articles by Anna Vietnitska, uh, uh, there is a proposal to amend the standard formula with the additional feature thought to be marriageable. And then the revised definition would go as follows. Bachelor is an unmarried man thought of as someone who could marry. Uh, interestingly enough, this is the exact same step which was recently suggested by Ken Hima in his latest book, uh, faced with the cases of Pope or a gay man who lives in jurisdiction in which uh, marriage is not recognized. He also uh, adds uh, that something must be institutionally or psychologically eligible to marry to count as a bachelor. Uh, in the reminder of this second point, I tried to show that simply adding some mental qualification as a person for the necessary feature neither solves the problem of need categorization nor vindicates the claim that bachelor is all or nothing concept. Uh, one of the important uh, uh, features of this analysis is that this categorization is relative to a particular social historical frame, uh, which implies that the meaning or the content of, of the defining features is also contingent and changing. And uh, these changes are easily detectable even in our linguistic practice. So in the shifting social historical circumstances in which legal status of a non-marital union is largely equated to that of marriage, an adult heterosexual man living in a cohabitation will hardly be considered bachelor. Uh, not to mention that it's very important the reasons for which uh, one is currently in the position of not being uh, married. That there are differences with those who are willingly uh, in such a relation uh, compared, for instance, to those who try to marry, but for whatever reason cannot uh, marry. And this changes a lot in the, in, and it's even, it's even uh, detected in linguistic practice, uh, not only in ling uh, English language, I suppose, in, uh, in, in different languages as well. Uh, so I argue that the social practice of bachelorhood is more adequately represented as a, as a graded one, uh, rather than as uh, all or nothing category admitting of uh, borderline cases. Finally, what are the implications for the conceptualization of a, a complex social practice for law? Uh, the most important consequence to my mind is the following. Cognitive psychologist experiments in categorization demonstrate clear limitations of the objectivist paradigm in legal philosophy, uh, which is epitomized in the dominant methodological strand of analytical jurisprudence, which HEMA labels as metaphysically driven conceptual analysis, but it is followed by other authors like Ratz or Green, Lady Gardner. Uh, according to it, concepts are seen as logical sets with clearly defined board boundaries, common attributes which are necessary and sufficient conditions for membership in the category, and all category instances treated are, are treated as equally good with regard to membership. Uh, now, William Ramsey uh, convincingly shows that lurking behind the project of 
this methodologically driven conceptual analysis are two important psychological assumptions about the nature of our cognitive system and categorization. First of them is that there is considerable overlap in the sorts of intuitive categorization judgments that different people make. And second is that our intuitions will nicely uh, converge upon a set uh, whose members are all and only those things which possess some particular condition, uh, collections of features. Uh, and again, experiments show that the predominance of typicality judgments uh, that which run contrary to, to these assumptions. Uh, and insofar as methodologically driven perceptual analysis uh, claims to rely on intuitive categorization judgments uh, as its initial empirical data, uh, it is far more constrained by our ordinary representation of concepts than, say, natural scientists in their conceptualization of law. This is not to say that there are not problems in the conceptualization in natural sciences. Obviously, there are a lot of uh, discussions uh, how categorizations are made, what are scientific taxonomies, uh, what is the role of similarity, how far uh, this categorization based on similarities should go, and so on and so forth. But this is just the, the, the question, and I'm not opening, obviously, here. Uh, secondly, uh, methodologically driven conceptual analysis was always clear about its main goal. Uh, for instance, take Frank Jackson's statement. Uh, Our account sees conceptual analysis of k good as the business of saying when something counts as a k. So basically, when you put it this way, you obviously, uh, you obviously uh, provides a standard of the success of this methodological approach. Uh, if, and this is how uh, uh, this methodology is understood among legal philosophers as well. So if for whatever reasons it fails in producing a clear cut demarcation line between instances of law and non-law, its successfulness can be reasonably questioned. And then there is a plenty of evidence in the writings of those very same proponents of this methodological approach that they are readily using uh, borderline cases. Most often it's exactly international law. And that was why I was interested you know, like to uh, explore the, this alternative root, root of uh, that theory of concepts. Uh, or take Raz's uh, discussion of legal systems, where right? uh, constantly uh, refers to, to the central typical case of, uh, of a legal system in comparison to some borderline cases. Finally, does everything said so far warrant the conclusion that the concept of law is best theoretically conceived as an array of features clustered around some sort of prototype? There is not a simple and straightforward answer to this question. Uh, probably these things would have been far easier. Uh, first of all, it depends uh, obviously what we want to do with, with the theory of law. There are different theories of, theories of law. Uh, that's why uh, I emphasize at the beginning that I'm interested in analytical accounts of law. But this again does not provide us like clearing much because a lot of, for instance, non-positivistic accounts also have uh, relied quite a lot on analysis. Uh, as we can see in Phoenix that analysis is a huge part of conceptualization of law. Uh, there are more firm statements like Leiter's that uh, theory should rely on, should be naturalized in a sense more uh, relying on empirical uh, studies. So in that sense, uh, maybe things would have been far easier if, if we could operate with results of some credible categorization study whose object is law. However, in its absence, uh, I thought that 
the second best option, especially when you work, work with first year law students, as I do, is to evoke some of the personal experiences uh, from those law classes. They certainly do not satisfy criteria of scientific rigor, uh, but they nonetheless indicate the relevance of typicality judgments in ordinary representation of law because first year law students uh, are basically uh, without some comprehensive knowledge of law, so you can count them as, as any ordinary representation uh, of law. Uh, These classes reveal stable patterns of a stuck student's categorization. They proceed from best examples of legal rules, uh, most usually those with some, uh, 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 so some of the uh, rules with measure of central tendency and then use them as prototypes against which other instances shall be judged on the basis of relevant similarities. Uh, so with the gradual accrual of knowledge, students certainly got to refine some of their positions and categorization judgments, but I suspect that even graduation and entry into profession changes much in the way they represent the concept. Uh, so I dare to presume that if faced with the question whether World Athletics Testosterone Rule fall under the concept of law, professional lawyers' judgments would split with a number of yes answers that would treat those rules as borderline cases at best. Uh, Leslie Green may have a final rebuttal from the camp of this methodology by German conceptualized. He says, and that this was a, a basically uh, uh, directed uh, against Schauer's uh, approach also, very uh, basic kind of introduction of prototype theory in the uh, course of law. Before we can know what is typical, we need to count. Before we can count, we need to know that what counts as what. Counting as is a matter of identifying necessary and sufficient conditions. And indeed, one may uh, sensibly ask, what my first year law students use as identifying markers for knowing that something serves as a typical case of law against which other instances are to be judged. So Green suggests that they need to operate with the full-fledged all or nothing concept of law before they can make categorization judgments. I think this is plainly wrong. Uh, I mean, we have a number of the, ex uh, the, the examples from, from uh, our daily lives. So people regularly judge certain political regimes as more or less democratic on the basis of dissimilarities with some central case that they have uh, in mind as a cluster of certain important features like free elections, multi-party system, political, periodical changes of government, etc. And a number of these categorization judgments quite often overlap with the informed expert opinions, despite the fact that those who express them are not political theorists and do not possess in-depth knowledge about political regimes. So those judgments are grounded in ordinary beliefs, uh, which we all collect as we go through life, being socialized, educated, conversing with friends, strangers, reading books, articles, watching TV and so on. And if we were lucky enough to get a good and proper education, most of those beliefs would be true and good enough to make competent categorization judgments. So the same holds for my first year students. By the time they get enrolled at the law program, most of them develop quite accurate beliefs about the complex social practice called law and tend to identify it by some features, that it is a set of rules or norms, that rules are enacted and applied by some institutions, uh, that rules are backed up uh, by coercion, that law and justice are intricately connected as witnessed by the shared etymological root of the two words in Serbian, Serbian language and so on. Uh, so ability to count and assert 
typicality judgment uh, neither requires nor is identical to concept formation. Uh, this more difficult and sophisticated task is left to do with things. Since the concept of law is not revisionist, legal philosophers relying on constraints dictated by the characterization experiments of cognitive psychology and working in analytical tradition needs to provide uh, um, something of a less ambitious project than this uh, kind of the thing uh, which is uh, envisioned, envisioned by methodologically driven conceptual analysis, which uh, Pierre Luigi Piazzoni uh, labels as explanatory elucidation of the structure of legal phenomena. Uh, this methodology is primarily decompositional in nature, insofar as it amounts to the process of breaking something down into its components. A highly abstract concept of law has to be broken down in a cluster of less typical yet typical, but the less abstract yet typical features that are constitutive of law as a social practice. And this is exactly the point where I see methodological intersection between prototype theory of concepts and analytical account of law. Uh, standing on that crossroad, legal philosopher proceeds by focusing on those features that are within the pursued theoretical project, considered more salient, more common, and possibly unique for the investigated social practice. And by the end of the day, this is the reason why we do not have one correct conceptualization of law. It very much depends on the, the aspect of the practice that one wants to, one wants to highlight. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this is this was like my more modest task to try to uh, show what are the possible points of uh, methodological cross cutting between jurisprudential methodology and prototype theory of concepts.